Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Sons of Antiquity podcast. I'm your host, Evan, and I'm joined in the studio by my co-host, Dan. Hello, everyone. Every nation, and certainly every empire, has its good years and bad years, its ups and downs, its successes and failures. But every now and then, a series of unfortunate events can snowball into a truly disastrous affair. The crisis of the 3rd century was one such affair. Beginning in 235 AD, five decades of ineffective emperors, foreign invasions, political uprisings, assassinations, plague, and financial misconduct nearly destroyed the Roman Empire. But in the midst of all the chaos and uncertainty, the boldness and political genius of one man prevailed, and that man was Diocletian. On today's episode, we'll explore the causes and effects of the crisis of the 3rd century. We'll learn about Diocletian's rise to fame, his governing style, and the unique reforms which stabilized the empire, but also the darker elements of his time on the throne. We'll then cover Diocletian's immediate and long-term legacy, and finally, give our assessments of his reign. Does he deserve to be ranked alongside great emperors like Trajan, Marcus Aurelius, and Augustus? Was he a controlling tyrant? And how could history have been different if Diocletian hadn't been around long enough to make any changes? Let's go back in time to the height of the Roman Empire. The first five emperors of the Nerva Antonine dynasty are generally considered the golden age for Rome, and they are fittingly called the five good emperors. They ruled from 96 to 180 AD, and the empire was at its greatest extent under these five. Then came Commodus, the son of Stoic legend Marcus Aurelius. See episode 34, Stoicism, for more on that. You won't regret it. He kind of ruined things, then got himself murked causing the year of the five emperors and a list of either ineffective, cruel, or degenerate heads of state under the Severan dynasty. They ruled from 193 to 235 AD. In 235, Severus Alexander was murdered by his own troops, beginning what is called the crisis of the third century. This lasted about 50 years, and it is exactly what it sounds like. During these 50 years, about 26 men claimed the throne, mostly usurping generals, When an emperor died or was killed by the military, the Senate chose their favorite guy and the armies refused, selecting their own emperor from their leadership. Sometimes legions would select different men. You can imagine that a civil war almost always resulted, which further weakened the empire and contributed to a vicious cycle of instability. This political instability caused barbarian invasions, civil wars, rebellions, currency debasement, economic collapse, plagues, and decreased Roman military capacity. It's really a miracle that the empire survived this period. One reason it lived on was the Emperor Aurelian, who ruled from 270 to 275 AD. Aurelian was an Illyrian, like his eventual successor Diocletian. He started from the bottom, if you will, as many of the crisis emperors did, and had a long and highly successful military career. He claimed the throne after the death of Claudius Gothicus on campaign, but he inherited a mess. Modern-day France, Germany, and Britain had split from the Roman Empire, styling themselves the Gallic Empire. Much of modern-day Turkey, all of the Middle Eastern provinces, and Egypt had likewise seceded, forming the Palmyrene Empire. During his five-year reign, he managed to conquer both empires, defeat a multitude of barbarian tribes, build strong walls around Rome, and curb hyperinflation. For this, he was hailed as Restitutor Orbis, a restorer of the world, and made his people refer to him as Master and God. He was the first emperor to mark the god Sol Invictus, or Conquering Sun, as supremely important, and in many ways set up the empire for monotheism. As you'll see, there are many parallels between Aurelian and Diocletian, with Aurelian serving as a precedent to Diocletian in many ways. Anyways, a corrupt official tricked Aurelian's officers into killing him. Thus ended the short but lively reign of the Restitutor Orbis. A handful of short-lived emperors followed, but everything would change with the ascension of a plebeian military officer named Diocles. Diocletian, whose given name was Diocles, was born on December 22, 245 AD in Croatia, specifically an area called Dalmatia, which lies along the eastern shore of the Adriatic Sea. The people of this region were collectively known as the Illyrians, and they regularly faced off against the Roman Republic. By 168 BC, Rome had managed to get them under control, and Illyria became an official province. By 6 AD, however, the Illyrians rebelled in an uprising known as Bellum Batononium. It took the Romans three years to crush the rebellion, but once they finally did, the Illyrians never made another attempt at independence. We bring this up because Diocletian joined the Illyrian army as a young man, and became part of an elite unit within their military. Due to his impressive capabilities, he was given a command position in Moesia, 
a province near the Black Sea. In 283 AD, Diocletian got the chance to escort the elderly Carus, the new emperor of Rome, to Persia as the commander of his personal cavalry guard, or Protectores Domesticus. Carus had just recently ascended to the throne following the assassination of the previous emperor, Probus, by his own men, and was on his way to Persia to intervene in a brewing civil war. This gave Diocletian a great opportunity to make a good impression on the most powerful man in Rome, and it even helped him win a consulship in the year 283. He would also go on to serve Carus's son, Numerian, in a similar capacity, after Carus unexpectedly died while on campaign due to illness or, as some sources claim, a freak lightning strike. Carus never set foot in Rome as emperor and only served for one year, R.I.P. His son's reign wouldn't last very long either. In 284 AD, Emperor Numerian was assassinated, and although Diocletian could have easily conspired to murder him, responsibility for the crime was pinned on a man named Arius Aper, who was the commander of the Praetorian Guard. He obviously had the means and opportunity, and as for motive, he was Numerian's father-in-law and may have wanted the throne for himself. Regardless of who was really responsible, there was serious business to attend to. A council of generals and tribunes was assembled at Nicomedia, a city which Diocletian would later establish as the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, and Diocletian was chosen to succeed Numerian. Diocletian accepted the position on the 20th of November, 284. After the ceremony, he swore aloud that he had nothing to do with the death of Numerian. He accused Aper of the assassination, drew his sword, and killed Aper personally in front of his army. It's worth noting that Diocletian had received a prophecy that he would become emperor on the day he killed a boar. And what is the word boar in Latin? Aper, prophecy fulfilled. Diocletian now had control of the eastern forces, and though Numerian's brother Carinus still ruled in the west, that was about to change. Diocletian's plan was to take advantage of the weakening public image of Carinus, who was having trouble keeping the high-level administrators from defecting. Diocletian marched his men through the Balkans for the remainder of the year and into the spring of 285, when his forces would meet Carinus's army near the Margus River in Moesia. There, Carinus would be betrayed and killed by his own men, and Diocletian would claim victory as the emperor of the entire Roman Empire. He would now be known as Gaius Aurelius Valerius Diocletian. Let's say, hypothetically, that you've just become emperor of Rome. Now what? How do you plan on managing an enormous empire without instant communication or rapid transit? How do you prevent local administrators from undermining your authority and or amassing power, which could splinter the empire? And how do you successfully repel foreign barbarians which are constantly threatening your borders? These were the immense challenges Diocletian faced on day one of his tenure. To put that in perspective, let's consider the size and scope of the Roman Empire in 285 AD. As emperor, Diocletian was in command of a territory which stretched at its farthest points about 3,000 miles, or 5,000 kilometers east to west, from modern-day Portugal all the way to Syria. From north to south, the empire reached from the British Isles down to North Africa, dipping well into Egypt. Keep in mind that the Silk Road was the primary means of trade at this time, internationally at least, and although it was almost 400 years old, the diseases, invasions, and internal conflicts which characterized the crisis of the 3rd century had disrupted major trade routes and compounded the problems that were going on in the Parthian and Kushan empires in the east. Needless to say, that was a lot for one man to deal with, which is why Diocletian decided to divide the empire in the early days of his reign. Since Diocletian was an east side boy through and through, he selected his son-in-law Maximian for the position of Caesar in the west. Maximian has occasionally been referred to as a Filius Augusti, or Augustan son, the theory being that Diocletian adopted him because he had no biological male heirs of his own. Maximian would preside over Rome proper and all territory west of modern-day Croatia, while Diocletian himself would rule everything east of that line. It may seem as though this arrangement was more of a co-emperorship, but in practice Diocletian was regarded as the senior ruler and retained the right to veto proposals made by Maximian, even after Maximian ascended from the lower position of Caesar to the title of Augustus, in the lead-up to his conflict with Carousius. This seemed to work for both men, and over the next few years Maximian would deal with many problems in the West. Peasant revolutionaries known as the Bagaudae were wreaking havoc in Gaul. Germanic tribes invaded shortly after the suppression of the rebellion, forcing him to return military campaigns in North Africa, piracy and pillaging along the English Channel, the corruption of Carasius, who was defeating the pirates and keeping their plundered goods for himself, war with Carasius, who declared himself Augustus and claimed northern Gaul and Britain as his own independent state, and finally, an uneasy truce with Carasius. Meanwhile, Diocletian kept himself busy in the east. 
fighting and solving various political problems in Moesia and Pannonia, and defeating the Sarmatians and Persians in North Africa and Asia Minor. During this extended campaign, King Bahram II opened his arms to Rome and ceded control of Western Armenia to Diocletian, which ushered in a new era of peace and cooperation between Rome and Persia. In early 291 AD, Diocletian and Maximian met in Milan to discuss the state of the empire and attend a number of public events and ceremonies. Diocletian made it a point to show his support for Maximian, despite his co-emperor's repeated blunders in his campaigns against barbarians and Carasius. Sometimes you just gotta project the image you want the people to see, even if it isn't completely real. But a couple of years after this meeting, Diocletian selected a new man to lead the war against Carasius, Maximian's son-in-law, Flavius Constantius. Diocletian also gave the title of Caesar to his own son-in-law, Galerius. With two Augusti and two Caesars, the Tetrarchy, or Rule of Four as it came to be known, was in full effect. Once Constantius defeated Carausius in 296, Roman territory was divided up in this manner. Constantius ruled over Gaul and Britain. Maximian controlled Spain, West Africa, and Italy. Galerius held the Balkans, and Diocletian ruled from Egypt to Byzantium and out into Armenia. Each ruler remained relatively autonomous in their regions and managed their own affairs. In the later years of Diocletian's rule, the Sassanids of Persia declared war on Rome, invaded Armenia, and even defeated Galerius in battle. Diocletian washed his hands of any responsibility and publicly shamed Galerius for his immense failure. But Galerius redeemed himself a few years later when Roman forces finally defeated the Sassanids and captured the wives and children of King Narsae, forcing the Persian ruler to accept Rome's terms. Those terms included Roman acquisition of strategic lands, return of Armenia to Roman control, and Iberia's allegiance to the empire. The Sassanids accepted, and in 299 AD, the Peace of Nisibis finally began. Considering that Diocletian's prolific reign lasted for over 20 years, let's go over the major changes he made in all facets of Roman life. First, the domestic political changes. Diocletian removed almost all privileges for Egypt and Italy. Previously, Italy had been tax-exempt due to deals made in a former age, and Egypt had been given a lot of autonomy in how it collected taxes. Let's just say that Egypt was infamous for tax evasion. That didn't sit well with Diocletian, who liked everything standardized and tidy. So he revoked their privileges, making them just like any other province when it came to tax collection. Egypt was not happy about this, so they revolted in 297, especially in Alexandria. Diocletian was forced into a long siege, and after the usurper died and the city was taken, Diocletian was not in a playful mood. He declared that he would slaughter the people of Alexandria until the blood ran up to his horse's knees. Right on cue, the horse immediately knelt. Diocletian took the hint from the gods and canceled his planned carnage. I love that story. That's interesting. <laughs> on a structural level, he also reduced the size of districts, making the total number 100. Nice and tidy, I might add. This limited the power of governors to start an uprising. Districts were organized into 12 what he called dioceses which were run by a vicar, who was appointed directly by the emperor to enact large-scale imperial programs. Governors were to be directly selected by and loyal to the emperor. Their main responsibilities were to take care of day-to-day -day things and financial matters. Military and civilian roles were firmly separated, similar to what we have today in the United States. No longer would governors like Julius Caesar lead armies against Rome. Governors did civilian work and generals took care of the military. Border provinces were organized as military areas. Repelling foreign invasions was the first priority. Interior provinces were organized as economic powerhouses and money makers to keep the empire supplied and prosperous. This also helped to make invasions less alluring since they would have to travel far into the interior to get to the real riches. The Senate received no deference from Diocletian. This was the hinge point between the Principate and the Dominant. In the Principate system, started by Augustus, the emperor was the first citizen and just one of the guys. He was accessible and just. There were a few men who tried to go against this and establish supremacy over the Senate, but most of them suffered early deaths. Diocletian wanted nothing to do with this fake submission to a body of irrelevant old men. He made himself extremely inaccessible, to the point that he became mythical in the eyes of the people. He openly displayed power and demanded people kiss his robes, which were purple by the way. He wore a diadem and wasn't afraid to demand open submission. Diocletian and subsequent emperors adopted the dominant system as we said, deriving from the word dominus, meaning lord. This directly evolved into the Byzantine emperor's style as well. Rome was no longer special. Diocletian didn't even bother visiting Rome until his 20th anniversary of becoming emperor, and he wasn't impressed. 
This disdain allowed Constantine to move the capital to Byzantium. Later, it became Constantinople, and for the Eastern Roman Empire to survive after the fall of Rome proper. On a related note, the Praetorian Guard was now just a garrison for the city of Rome. Constantine abolished them altogether years later. Thus ended the storied history of what was once the most powerful institution in the empire. Diocletian was an autocrat by nature. He turned to systematic thinking and centralized bureaucracy to accomplish his goals. Under his control, the imperial bureaucracy went from 15,000 to 30,000 hired professionals, set up with a military-like hierarchy. Bureaucracy became very complex and would directly evolve into the Byzantine system. And just so you know, Byzantine is now an adjective meaning intricately organized, like a labyrinth. Now that we have detailed Diocletian's political reforms, we can explain what his military reorganization looked like. The Roman Empire now had a defensive rather than an offensive stance on border security and foreign invasions. Diocletian employed a strategy that many modern scholars call the defense in depth system. Diocletian realized that the legions could not actually protect the entire border from invasion, so he made towns and cities fortified with huge walls, a precursor to medieval castles and walled cities. When a foreign army invaded, it had a few options. 1. Besiege a highly fortified city. 2. March past the city and risk a attack from the rear. 3. Go far into the empire and become encircled by the legions that were sent to stop you. Or 4. Retreat before a response could be organized. All four options did little damage to the Romans, yet used a lot of resources for the invaders. It gave the legions, who were scattered throughout the border provinces, time to respond to an invasion. The theory was that the further in the invaders got, the more entangled they would become, like a spider web. Generals were named ducks, which is where the medieval duke comes from. The legions were reduced in size, but increased in number. Smaller legions meant more border coverage and more flexibility in dealing with invasion and uprising. Militias were formed in the border provinces to raise the alarm and slow down invasions, but they were only a first responder and the full-time army was nothing to scoff at. Under Diocletian, the number of soldiers went from 350,000 to 500,000, largely due to conscription. Now on to economic reform. Diocletian walked into a dumpster fire when he usurped the throne. Inflation was rocking the economy from the chaos of the 3rd century. Prices were skyrocketing, wages were stagnant, and savings were vanishing. Diocletian attempted to stabilize the currency by issuing a new set of coins with set values, using brass and copper for lower denominations, silver for sizable transactions, and gold for huge deals. However, this was not enough to fix inflation, because he didn't call back the bad coins. Diocletian's new coins just flooded the nation with even more money, making it worse. Nobody understood economics or the root cause of inflation, so they weren't effective at solving economic woes. To make the system function without a solid currency, Diocletian changed the tax code to accept taxes paid in kind. He developed an elaborate equivalency chart that converted basic goods into tax units. So let's say that one tax unit could be paid in 5 pigs, 1 cow, 50 shirts, 15 shoes, etc. Each person was assessed on how many tax units they owed and they paid in any form they could. Farmers paid in livestock and crops, cobblers paid in shoes, etc. This cut out the middleman of currency and succeeded in getting the legions what they needed instead of more useless metal. To determine what was needed, Diocletian developed the first budget in Western history and apportioned it out based on population and wealth. In order to halt instability and make his new policies work, Diocletian nationalized all trade guilds, making them all state agencies with state employees and complete state control. He forbade people to change jobs, and professions were purely hereditary, so if your father was a carpenter, all his male descendants would be carpenters too. Since his edicts were not working to curb inflation, crazy, Diocletian decided that it must be the greedy merchants who were driving the prices up on everything. Also sounds familiar. He issued his edict on prices, which set a price ceiling on every item imaginable. Charging more than the stated price was, on paper at least, punishable by death. His edict was entirely impotent. There were not enough government agents to check every transaction all throughout the vast empire, so people routinely ignored the edict and bought things at their market prices. The edict on prices was quietly abandoned a few years later, but it serves as an intriguing case study on how things were valued in an idealized Roman economy. As a wise man once said, the free market, uh, finds a way. And actually they had different types of beers listed with maximum prices. In, and, the, in the edicts? Yes, and... All of them were the same besides Egyptian beer that was half price. Why? I guess it was the Coors Light of its time. <laughs> oh, no wonder. 
And also, um, he valued the purple dye that he would be the only one using. So you can imagine that's like him trying to save money because he's the only one buying it. And what are they going to do? Sell him, sell it to him for hire? Yeah, you're not going to rip off the emperor, right? This is all interesting, but what most people know Diocletian for is his severe persecution of Christians. Persecutions of Christians had existed in the empire since the age of the apostles, but there was no official universal persecution until the crisis of the 3rd century. Nero infamously executed a number of Christians after blaming them for the fire in Rome, but the persecution didn't spread beyond the city. The first notable persecution took place around 250 AD under Decius, who declared that all within the empire had to sacrifice to the Roman gods, which produced martyrs and apostasy. The next emperor, Valerian, ordered all known Christians to work in the mines, followed by another edict, which mandated the death penalty. But Valerian was captured by the Persians and used as a footstool, at which point the church enjoyed 40 years of peace. Supposedly, the emperor used him as a footstool to get on his throne. Really? Nice! (laughs) Degraded him. Diocletian was faithful to the old Roman gods and aimed to restore Rome to its former glory. Make Rome great again, if you will. As an autocrat at heart, Diocletian believed that unity within the empire was essential to its success. By 300 AD, Christians accounted for roughly 10% of the Roman people, although they were more concentrated in the east and in cities. The spark for persecution began in 299. The pagan priests were unable to conduct divinations on sacrificed animals, which they blamed on, quote, profane men, unquote, who were in the vicinity. This was determined to mean Christians, who had been seen crossing themselves during the ceremony. Diocletian and Galerius forced all court officials and soldiers to perform a sacrifice to the gods and emperor. Disobedience meant loss of rank, career, and wealth, but it seems like this first stage didn't involve any bloodshed, besides a few cases. In 302, a Christian deacon in Antioch named Romanus burst into an imperial sacrifice and denounced their pagan practices, leading to his eventual execution. The audacity of this deacon led Diocletian and Galerius to leave for Nicomedia. They spent the winter debating what to do with this religious minority. Diocletian thought that forbidding them from public roles would be enough, while Galerius advocated for their total extermination. Galerius won that argument, and in February of 303, Diocletian ordered a major church in Nicomedia to be burned to the ground along with its scriptures. Immediately following was the first edict against the Christians. It targeted the clergy and the property of Christians. It prohibited Christian worship and ordered churches, liturgies, and scriptures to be universally destroyed. Christians were to be deprived of their citizenship, ranks, and even freedoms in the case of former slaves. Against Diocletian's wishes, there were many martyrs, mostly in the East. It is worth noting that Constantius, the father of Constantine, did not enforce the edict in the West, making him a low-key hero to Christians and giving his son Constantine grounds to take up that mantle. Diocletian's second edict ordered all priests and bishops to be imprisoned. The prisons overflowed with the clergy, and according to Eusebius, they had to let actual criminals free to make room. His third edict gave amnesty to all imprisoned Christians if they sacrificed to the gods. This served to reduce the amount of faithful Christians and cause schism within the church as to what should be done with apostates who wished to return. In 304, the fourth edict ordered every single person within the empire to offer sacrifice publicly on penalty of death. When Diocletian and Maximian abdicated in 305, the persecution was only continued in the east, but just as vigorously as before. As mentioned earlier, Diocletian made his one and only visit to the city of Rome proper in 303 AD to attend a celebration of his 20th anniversary as emperor, but he was quite disappointed by all of it and left early. Soon after, he contracted some sort of mild sickness while leading a military campaign against the Carpi people near modern-day Romania, and this sickness worsened month after month. Keep in mind that this man was in his early 60s at this point. When he returned to his lavish palace in Spalatum, in what is now the city of Split, Croatia, he gave a public speech at the grand opening of a circus near his home and collapsed in front of the crowd, likely as a result of a stroke. He hid away in his home for the rest of that year and into the spring of the following year, but when he finally emerged, he was nearly unrecognizable. It was this medical episode, occurring at the height of his power and ego, which persuaded him to surrender the throne and retire. So in May of 305 AD, Diocletian gathered his top advisors and generals in Nicomedia and informed them of his plans to retire and to have Maximian abdicate as well. This allowed Constantius and Galerius to take up the roles of Augusti and Maximinus and Severus to become the new Caesars. This was the first time in Roman history that an emperor had voluntarily resigned 
Though Diocletian's home was far from the centers of Roman government and politics, it was not without amenities. It had its own temple, a mausoleum, colonnaded streets, a bathhouse, large sturdy walls, and beautiful gardens, where farmer Diocletian spent many of his final years growing cabbages. In fact, when begged to return to power to restore stability to a warring empire, he reportedly replied, quote, If you could show the cabbage that I planted with my own hands to your emperor, he definitely wouldn't dare suggest that I replace the peace and happiness of this place with the storms of a never-satisfied greed. Incredibly, large portions of the 1,700-year-old palace are still around today, and the site, which is a popular tourist attraction, has been listed by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site since 1979. And let me add, they've converted the temple into a church just to spit on him more. Nice, talking about dancing on his grave. That's pretty cool. Fun fact here, Diocletian's palace was used as the backdrop for numerous scenes in Season 4 of Game of Thrones. The colonnaded walkways were filled with props, set pieces, and extras to create the marketplace of the fictional slave city of Marine, and the catacombs of the complex were made to look like dungeons and even a throne room for Daenerys Targaryen. While in retirement, the old and ill former emperor was forced to watch from afar as the tetrarchy he so cleverly devised ripped apart at the scenes and succumbed to the ambitions of the twin rulers. The civil war raged on until 312 AD, when Constantius's son Constantine would claim victory at the Battle of Milvian Bridge. But Diocletian would not live to see the end of the war, and maybe that's for the best. He died in his home in October of 311, perhaps due to his own poor health and old age, or perhaps by his own hand. Historians are unsure. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's go back and talk about the aftermath of Diocletian's reign. So after Diocletian and Maximian abdicated in 305, the Caesars, Constantius Chlorus in the west and Galerius in the east, were elevated to Augusti. They had arranged for two generals, Flavius Severus in the west and Maximinus Dia in the east, to be the new Caesars. This left two young men feeling very slighted, though. Constantius Chlorus had a son named Constantine, and Maximian had a son named Maxentius. Both had been left out. Also, both new Caesars were connected to Galerius, so Constantius was isolated. But soon that wouldn't matter. The next year, Constantius died from natural causes in the modern-day city of York, England. When the army heard, they proclaimed his son Constantine as Augustus of the West. And keep in mind, that was Augustus, not Caesar. Britain and Gaul recognized this claim. Galerius impotently fumed but bargained with Constantine, recognizing him as Caesar and elevating Severus to Augustus. Maxentius felt extra slighted after this, so he conspired with the people of Rome to have himself declared leader of Italy and Africa. Severus marched on Rome but was unable to take the city due to its Aurelian walls and mass desertions to the son of Maximian. Maximian joined his son in Rome and they killed Severus in Ravenna. Galerius marched on Italy too, unable to accept the murder of an Augustus, but he was unable to take Italy as well. Meanwhile, Constantine stayed neutral and married Maximian's daughter. The Tetrarchy was officially broken. With Severus dead, Constantine proclaimed himself Augustus of the West. Nobody had the power to do anything, but Maximian and Galerius convinced Diocletian to hold a conference and discuss how to save the Tetrarchy. Though Diocletian refused to become the senior Augustus on account of his cabbages, the three men decided who would be in charge from now on. Maximian agreed to stop trying to come out of retirement. Maxentius was officially proclaimed an illegitimate usurper. Galerius and Maximinus Dia remained in charge in the east, and a new man, Licinius, was promoted to Augustus of the West. As you can imagine, Constantine did not take this demotion to Caesar lying down. Both he and Maxentius continued calling themselves Augusti. The old man Maximian made a series of incomprehensible blunders that sealed his fate. He tried to overthrow his son, Maxentius, but when that failed, he fled to Galerius. That didn't last long, so he fled to Constantine's court. Then he came up with this brilliant idea. He claimed that Constantine had died and that he was the new Augustus. Nobody believed it, and when Constantine showed up, he politely told Maximian to kill himself. He did so in 310. Galerius died of natural causes in 311, promoting Maximinus Dia to Augustus. Constantine marched on Rome and killed Maxentius in the famous Battle of the Milvian Bridge in 312. This was the day after Constantine received a vision of a Cairo and was told, In this sign, conquer. Chi and Rho are the first two letters of the word Christos in Greek. This was the beginning of Constantine's conversion to Christianity. Licinius and Maximinus split the East between themselves, but a civil war between the two resulted in the defeat of Maximinus and consolidation of the East 
under one Augustus by 313. With the empire now split between two Augusti, they ratified their alliance in Milan, where the Edict of Milan was issued jointly. The Edict of Milan granted full tolerance to all religions, but it was mostly about Christianity. By 320, Lucinius broke his promise and began persecuting Christians in the east, giving Constantine an excuse to declare war. The Battle of Adrianople in 324 was framed as a battle between paganism and Christianity. Though outnumbered, the zealous Christian army defeated Licinius and his men. After the Battle of the Hellespont and the Battle of Chrysopolis, Licinius and his Caesar surrendered. They lived another year until Constantine eliminated them. This ended the civil wars of the Tetrarchy and saw Constantine as the sole ruler of a united empire. The same year Constantine declared that Byzantium would be the new capital of the empire. Six years later, the city was ready for an Augustus, and it was renamed Constantinople. Constantine convened the First Council of Nicaea in 325, which was the first Christian ecumenical council and produced the Nicene Creed. Although not a Christian until his deathbed, every emperor after him would be a Christian, with the exception of Julian the Apostate. Thus the concept of Christendom united under an absolute monarch was introduced to Europe and the rest of the Roman realm. But what are the long-term effects of Diocletian's reign? Diocletian's tetrarchic system did not last far beyond his own abdication, so it cannot be said that this part had long-term effects. But what about the rest of his reign? Though he was hardly the first to do so, he was the first to do so of his own free will, and he set the precedent for future imperial rule. For example, the sons of Constantine ruled over different parts of the empire before killing each other, and the last emperor to rule both east and west was Theodosius the Great, who died in 395 AD. Diocletian's snubbing of Rome was standard operating procedure for emperors after him. Upon the reunification of the empire under Constantine, he immediately moved the capital to Byzantium in modern-day Turkey. Even when the empire split into east and west, the emperors more often than not sat in Ravenna, which is in northeastern Italy. Ravenna was simply closer to the tumultuous borders. So what can be said about the Diocletianic persecution? Well, it was the worst and last persecution of Christians that ever happened in the Roman Empire, and claimed more victims than any other. Despite this, most historians place the executions at 3,500 at the highest. However, many more were tortured for the faith, becoming by definition confessors, including big names like St. Nicholas. Also, a much larger number of people apostatized. With Christians being 10% of Rome's population and occupying all levels of society, the brutal persecution only helped to bring sympathy to the sect. It also helped Constantine the Great portray himself as a liberator and gain control of the whole empire. And Constantine is one of those great men who actually changed the course of history by himself. Though Diocletian didn't stamp out Christianity, he did cause a big split in the church that would have to be resolved in the coming centuries, especially in northern Africa. The Donatist Christians believed that only saints should be considered Christians. In particular, they believed that apostates and traitors to the faith could not be received back, and that sacraments administered by traitors were invalid. St. Augustine battled them in his time, mid-400s, and though they were condemned by church councils, they only went away after the Arabs conquered them. It's also worth noting that Diocletian brutally stamped down the Manichaean religion. Manichaeism was a religion from Persia which posited that the spiritual world was created by a good god, and the material world was created by an evil god, who were perpetually fighting each other for supremacy. They were a form of Gnosticism which snuck its way into the church later on on many occasions. Diocletian really hated Manichaeans because they were both Persian, aka a fifth column, and non-compliant with imperial edicts. Diocletian's takeover of all guilds and prohibition of job changing set the stage for medieval feudalism. It established a caste system where there was almost no mobility between professions, much less classes. The standardization of walled cities surrounded by farmland also reminds us of medieval Europe. Diocletian set the tone for European monarchy from that point forward, impacting over 1,000 years of Western civilization. The Senate was reduced to obscurity, and absolute monarchy with divine right was the new normal. All in all, what can we say about the Emperor Diocletian? Like most people, he was a mixture of good and bad. Of course, I can't ignore how he persecuted Christians more than any other Roman emperor. In my opinion, that is the biggest stain on his record, bar none. And let's be honest, it was more about letting Galerius off the leash than implementing his own genocidal ideology. In the end, though, God works in mysterious ways. If it hadn't been for Diocletian, we very likely would never have gotten Constantine, and the history of Christianity would be very different. Economically, Diocletian was a mixed bag. He had good intentions and pretty sound ideas about the currency, 
but his one mistake of not recalling the bad coins ruined his plans. His payment in kind tax scheme was merciful to the taxpayers and life-saving to the legions. He basically returned the tax system to bartering in order to get around inflation, and it was an improved method. He must be credited with forming the first budget in European history too. In many ways, he was ahead of his time. However, his establishment of feudalism left a lot to be desired, though it wasn't as bad as modern people think, and I'm talking about feudalism. Progressives would do well to consider Diocletian's attempt at price controls before they try to make the same mistakes again. Despite this, almost everyone was better off when Diocletian abdicated than when he started. In domestic politics, his legacy is almost entirely stellar. He took a broken empire and made it functional again, even if only for a time. A lot can be said for the stability he brought to the citizens of Rome. He ended 50 years of anarchy and bought Rome a lot more time before it finally fell. Considering everything, I would say that Diocletian was much better than average. A solid B, if you will. If he hadn't persecuted Christianity, I would place him in the top five for Roman emperors before the fall of Rome. But including that, I would place him somewhere in the top ten. Having no prior knowledge of Diocletian or even this particular period in Roman history, I was pleasantly surprised to learn so many fascinating things while researching for this episode. I'm always on the hunt for these types of things, new stories and biographies that can give us some insight into how things are playing out and could play out in our modern day. Diocletian was a complex leader who came to power at a complex time. I think what's best about his legacy is that it can teach us what to do and what not to do, which are equally important. He definitely deserves a lot of credit for what he got right, like the Tetrarchy, his successful military campaigns, his negotiations in North Africa and Asia Minor, making moves in silence, if you will, until the time was right to take power for himself, and the importance of a peaceful, well-fortified retirement plan. But the persecution of Christians and his complete lack of financial sense also deserve criticism. More than anything, I'm amazed at how the currents of history, which are usually determined by the actions, attitudes, and the will of the masses, were funneled down into the hands of just one man. Rarely does this happen, but when it does, it benefits us greatly to study it in painstaking detail. As for how Diocletian ranks among the other Roman emperors, I'm more of a big picture guy, so how the heck should I know? So, what did we learn today? Diocletian stabilized an empire that had been through 50 years of instability and brought some semblance of order and prosperity. Despite his successes, the brutal persecution of Christians, various economic experiments, and long-term failure of his new governmental system put a stain on his legacy. His reign had a huge impact on Europe and the Mediterranean, which lasted over a thousand years after his death. And now, lingering questions. Should Diocletian be blamed for his economic policies, or was it simply ignorance? Well, I think when you consider how other emperors had managed to fight inflation and how other civilizations had done that, like this wasn't the first time that a a currency in the world had ever started to inflate. I I can't really cut him as much slack as maybe some other people could. Like you, You could have figured out how other people did it, how other people fought hyperinflation. For example, Aurelian before him had managed to curb inflation. So why didn't he just replicate the policies of Aurelian? That would be my question. You know, you had an example set for you right there just a few years ago. Why not just copy that? I think he kind of like closed, Aurelian closed a lot of mints, I think. So, oh, I, so he just stopped printing money. Hmm, imagine that. <laughs> Wish we could figure that out. And uh, Diocletian also, as punishment to the Alexandrians, he shut down their mint. Hmm, interesting. But they were allowed to just do whatever they want with their mint. Each mint was pretty independent. Really? That's interesting. Yeah, and as far as his other economic policies, like making people stay in the same job forever, I think that was more just his personality of having to control things and have it be not neat and tidy. Because I just imagine him having a conniption if he hears taxman, oh, 20 people changed jobs last year, and now we got to redo this whole system and recalculate it. It seems like it would give him quite an anxiety attack. Is Diocletian a relatable guy? In many ways, not at all. But in many ways, I, I'm similar to him. So I would say half and half. I don't I don't demand to be worshipped out in public, and I'm not going to wear purple, even if I were to become president or whatever. It just seems a little extra. Yeah, I mean, if you thought that uh, Barack Obama's tan suit was controversial, and then later Biden's tan suit was controversial, just wait until Evan is president and he's wearing a purple suit. The... It, won't, it won't be a suit. It'll be a robe. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. CNN, MSNBC, they're going to go crazy. 
you're probably thinking, oh, I'm similar to him in, in personality. Yeah, the, the fact that nobody before him did a budget, it's just, it, it boggles my mind. That is fascinating and strange. And it would be me to just get prices on everything and just make them into a nice spreadsheet and cover them with tax units. I, I like that idea. I, I, I could see that. Now, I don't think you'd be the type to just uh, kill a suspected murderer in front of a crowd, though. Well, that's not really your style. You'd have no. him taken back somewhere <laughs> and disposed of secretly, discreetly. <laughs> Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, you know? Also, of course, just his farmer mentality. I just, I love that. The cabbages. Oh, if you could just see my homestead. That would be you, uh, retiring and just farming. That's definitely going to be you, 100%. You and your cabbages. Do you find him relatable at all? I don't know. I mean, it is hard to relate to someone who had so much power, but I think the logic of the tetrarchy. That's something that I probably would have tried to do and probably would have equally, you know, f- f- I probably would have failed just as much as he did. You know, that would have been something I would have thought, hmm, this is too big for me to handle. Let me put some guys I trust in positions of power and we'll make it work. And then as soon as that personal relationship dissolves, because that was really what made it work, was that he had a personal relationship with Maximian. So if you got your son-in-law in there, it's probably going to be easier for you guys to figure it out like a family business. It's going to be easier to work things out. But once you start bringing in other people and it gets farther and farther removed, you know, it's going to fall apart. So I think that's, that is something I would try. Hey, let's just try this new system. So I can relate to that. Let's just try a new system, new way of doing things. Maybe it'll work. Yeah. He seems kind of naive for the whole tetrarchy system. I'm going to, we're going to split power between four people and nothing will go wrong. There won't be any civil war at all. And also we're just going to pass it on to another generation. And we will never have a problem with people getting big egos in the land of the biggest egos, Rome. One final question. Was this episode more interesting than you thought it would be, Dan? It was. As I mentioned in my review there at the at the end, I went into it thinking, wow, who is this guy? Never heard of any of this stuff. I had no clue what I was getting into. But once I started researching it, it really spoke to me, this era of crisis and then healing and taking an empire that is almost on the brink of destruction and turning it around completely 180 and fixing it and helping it last for at least 150 more years. So that's pretty cool. I think there's a lot of lessons we can learn from that. So that's what I really appreciated was that this was a critical time in their history that has a lot of modern similarities. If I may be so bold as to say anacyclosis, anarchy transitioning to monarchy, to a strong man. Yes, that I think is the exa- a great example of the final stage leading back into the first stage. Yes, sir. And it took a strong man to get them out of that anarchy. They had a lot of people who had been selected by the Senate or just some Legion's favorite guy, and that, that didn't last. Yeah, and that is a great point there, Evan. Where was, where was the Senate during all of this? How was the Senate fixing the crisis of the third century? They didn't. They spent 50 years floundering. That is something that we need to understand about our modern political quagmire here in America, is that the Senate or Congress can't get us out of this. That's fair, but we're, at that point, the Senate was it had no real power anyway. So him coming in and just not even playing with their game, it was basically just status quo. So it had been a while since the Senate actually did anything. It was more of a social club at that point, prestige. Fair. Which some could say that's the way our Congress is becoming, but you're right. In the case of 50 years of anarchy, it took a strong man to bring them all together. And he had to last a while. So 20 years is a pretty good time to get things back together. Although they would kind of collapse after him until Constantine came. Constantine is another strong man that helped stabilize the empire. Agree, 100%. That's all for today's show. Make sure to like, subscribe, and leave your comments. Join us again next time for even more Ancient Wisdom. Rome can be summed up in a single word. It was in the foot of the